what's up there workforce and possibly new visitors to work to game I'm Chris and this is a huge topic. The simple answer is yes, Final Fantasy XIV Shadowbringers will be worth a play in 2020 and is likely to finish as one of the greatest MMO expansions of all time for any game. This game has been improving after a rough start with 1.0 and I can only hope this isn't the peak with just how incredible this game has been so far. First, we will talk about everything Shadowbringers already has to offer as of 2019 when the current expansion was released. From there, we will talk about what 2020 will give us over the course of the year since we know it will likely follow a pattern us long-term players have come to expect, and the surprises have been hinted at well enough to guess, generally, what may come our way, but I will unfortunately not have the details until we hear from the devs as the year moves along. Lastly, assuming the expansion is still drawing in new players, as they ended 2019 setting yet another record for the number of players, I will talk about what this game has to offer to New Warrior of Light and even Darkness, since games that have been running on this long are like huge theme parks where even if the newest section didn't end up interesting you, you still have literally years of great content that is still around and may just have exactly what you were looking for in your next MMO. Whether returning, already playing, or thinking of jumping in for the first time on this adventure, 2020 promises to be an incredible year for 14, so let's back up these claims with a show of what all this game has to offer. Now what all do we have so far? Speaking only of Shadowbringers, our story opened up on possibly the best MMO story I have ever been told. This video will remain spoiler free, but our channel has a lore playlist if you want to know what's up. I am known for not being the lore guy here on the channel, and I have done the community frowned upon thing of skipping cutscenes and blowing past quest text, and will say this time around is different. It has gone so far as to make me consider playing back through old content I may have skipped to have a deeper understanding of stories I may have missed. Expansions past would help me understand some of the world building and character development that already gripped me, even without having them in Shadowbringers, since I skipped most of ARR, parts of Heavensward, and huge chunks of Stormblood, I sped through this when I just wanted to get back to gameplay. As a narrative-driven PvE experience, 14 has always offered just a little more to players that like lore, but I have found that it has plenty of good things outside of the story to enjoy. This time around, however, I would say give the story a chance at least through the first dungeon. If by then it doesn't grip you, then treat it like every other MMO and get to leveling because these zones are stunning. The lore guy here on the channel historically has been Brian. If you want to skip it and use our videos to catch up, but I would suggest other creators like Ethis Asher if going deeper, especially going deeper than the game could possibly expect, is really your goal and you don't want to do it yourself. Now within these new zones, the music this time is literally so good I am a little offended that it was not even nominated for Best Music at 2019 Game of the Year show. But let's stay on topic. My personal favorite zone is the forest for the way it plays with the light and the immersive nature of the vocals in the soundtrack, but there are strong arguments for some of the other zones this time around. The combat system is more of what we have come to expect, with some of the classes getting drastic overhauls where needed and others being left alone because they tend not to break what isn't broken. For anyone not familiar with the game, your one character has access to all of the classes, which we call jobs, simply at the swap of your equipped weapon. This makes the ability to try tanking, which has really been simplified this time around, or heal, which can sometimes find time to DPS, or a straight melee or ranged DPS, totally easy to switch and change any time your play style really needs to differ and you don't have to play through that big long story again. They have a mode called New Game Plus if you'd like to play through the story again, but that way it's really your option of how to enjoy Final Fantasy XIV. When looking at a subscription game, it needs to deliver hours of fun for your money, not just once, but every single month, so making this a way to seamlessly adjust your playstyle is a wonderful feature. We have gotten some solid dungeons and added a trust system so you can go in with NPCs if you end up without wanting to wait for a party, though by design they're not as fast as players would be. Plenty of instance content has made grinding for tombstones reasonable, which we use to buy our endgame gear, Kind of, but yes, gear also drops from kills. The end game level chasing is is definitely a thing in 14, but the gear optimization is much easier to understand than most MMOs. Our open world content has gotten a refresh with the reason to do the world quest open battles, full action time events, or fates for short, 
which now have a currency to grind for neat rewards. This pairs well with hunts, where we seek out challenges to slay alone or as they go up in rank in groups. Not to be outdone, beast tribes have been on point so far, but we'll see more of that as the expansion goes on. Beast Tribes are factions we explore and rank up through quests that we can do daily, but in this game, daily quests are not required to stay caught up. Beast Tribes are very, very optional. So much so that the first new one in 2020 will actually be centered on Gathering, which is an all-new thing, which is just the beginning of everything that has changed for professions. We have started the rebuilding of Ishgard, a lost city of sorts that each server must separately work together with all the players on it on a grand scale, and it has paved the way for a total refresh to the crafting and gathering system which were already debatably the deepest in any MMO I have ever played. PvP got a new game type added, though I will freely admit if PvP is your primary joy in MMOs, this game is still far from leading in that category. It's nice to have a break from things, and I kind of want some of the rewards locked behind it if I ever get around to doing the amount of it they call for, but just wanting to make it clear. PvP in 14 is super fun and even unique in some ways. It just happens to be the weakest part of everything 14 has to offer. So if that is your sole focus, I am just trying to state very clearly that that may be one of the things that makes this game hard to palette. Now as you get into more high-end content, we have gotten some incredible 8-man fights and our 24-man raids this time around are a crossover content from Nier Automata. Yes, that Nier Automata. It's been well done and well received and it's intriguing to see how they're tying in the lore of one game into our world and it is our largest but far from only crossover content to date. We have gotten Savage and Extremes, which are our harder modes of fights, and we can expect that to continue since it allows the normal modes to be much more attainable. We have even gotten our first of usually two ultimate fights, the hardest content 14 can throw at us. And it was tough enough this time around to cause some drama, with the world race being, let's call it eventful. Those never get easier, and when new expansions drop, going back and doing those is still quite a challenge because they force you to scale back down to the level as it was. This expansion has been impressively packed every patch so far, so I am sure I'm leaving things out because getting all of it is a daunting task, giving me a chance to focus on what seems most fun to me rather than feeling I have to play every part of every patch to completion to not get bored. Now having been playing since 2.0, which was the expansion that relaunched this game as we now know it, much of what we have come to expect is centered on a framework that they have delivered on in the past. So this next part is all an educated guess from a channel that has published somewhere in the ballpark of 2,000 videos on this game, but just know that it could change. Those videos go deeper on a whole range of topics, so if I gloss over something and you want more, we might just have it. So what can we expect during 2020? Well, historically, the game has gone to patch 0.55, so we can assume patch 5.55 will be the one to lead us into 6.0 in the middle of 2021. Content is usually summed up in full patches and half patches, such as 5.2 and 5.25. This lets you feel like you can take your time with the main serving in a 5.2 or 5.3, and then have some of the other content a little bit later as to not burn you out if you're interested in more than one part of the game, since the side content will typically shift into the point 0.5, like 5.25. Patch 5.0 and 5.1 got us through the first six months of the game, and we wrap up 2019 with patch 5.15 going into 5.2 scheduled for mid-February, which is right on pace. As this goes on, we can expect the catch-up mechanics to kick in to help players just getting to Shadowbringers to join in, and the patches will offer more and more to do in the gaps between new story missions being added. The devs encourage breaks, so this isn't a game you have to play every day if you just want a clear story in each instance once for just a few times. But if you start to like more parts of this game, it offers more than you could possibly complete. And if you really aim to earn every achievement in the game and master everything 14 has grown to include, I just don't even see how there's time in the day. Now with 5.2, we will get a new dungeon to go with the new story, along with the next parts of the restoration of Ishgard. This will continue to update throughout the expansion, so each content cycle will add something to it. We're also going to bring back a piece of Heavensward content that was called Diadem and gear it solely towards gathering as instanced content and new content for fishers that sounds like a raid on a boat based on the very little that we've been shown so far. 
The next beast tribe is indeed gathering focused, and with Restoration having spent 5.1 on making the entry even easier for crafters, disciples of hand, and gatherers, disciples of land, they appear to be ready to offer some things to the hardcore and more veteran players, such as leaderboards, new stuff to gather, and even expert recipes to craft. For anyone not familiar with crafting in this game, it is a whole class in this game. It is its own job. It has skills that you have to use to complete crafting. It's a mini game where you aim to fill a craftsmanship bar before the durability bar reaches zero. It's a turn-based set of actions, and you have a mana pool that you will also be trying to use to fill a quality bar for a chance at getting higher quality loot if merely just completing the craftsman bar to get the loot wasn't challenge enough. Gathering has a similar minigame, though it's less intense until you start to talk about timing and things like timed unspoiled nodes and collectibles and so on. These systems can get as deep as you want them to. The focus this expansion making hand and land much more supported with content alongside the consistent relatively typical large scale offering to battle classes means a wider variety of players than ever before are getting huge sums of content they want and there is plenty to do. This is not at the expense of the battle content, this is in addition to. Now 5.2 also marks when we dive into a relic grind, though as of now we don't know much about what it will be outside of the phrase independent, which hints at more of what we had in 2.0 and 3.0 than the large scale mostly group content we got in 4.0, which each have had a slightly different relic grind. That being said, they liked Eureka, the 4.0 system, a great deal, and I would expect some of the lessons learned to carry over, so keeping up this time around would likely be worth the effort. Last time, it ended in a finale that left me envious I had gotten off the train, for those of you looking for a pun, a couple of chapters in, and I didn't quite have time to catch back up, and so I was stuck simply enjoying streams of what appeared to be simply insanity. We would also be getting our next trial fight and their savage version since on the evens we get a four and an eight man and on the odds we get a four and a 24 man piece of content we also appear to be getting a tool style relic this time around so it'll be interesting to see how that pans out with crafters having their very own upgradable progression to follow for the first time ever point two five will also likely give us our side story which is a relatively optional but good for a laugh uh, story kind of centered around a character named hildebrand it's just interesting to see what that would mean, given that 5.0 takes place in a completely different world, per se, unlike previous expansions. We got the second chapter of our limited job, the Blue Mage, in 5.15 with the new PvP mode, so it is possible this is where the missing Blue Mage content falls, which would give you a chance to play as a job not bound by the typical progression of the rest of the battle system, in trade for not being allowed to level to current cap, and therefore being locked out of some types of content. It goes under the term limited job. It's been mixed in its reception, but with this game being big enough that you don't have to like any one piece of it, I've really enjoyed having the fun of running around with the different spells it has to offer for the time that I've spent on it. My one regret is that it doesn't call for more of my time. It has new mounts and craziness tied behind it. It's very quick to level. So if you come back and haven't tried it, you might want to spend a few hours with it. Now, as we go into patch 5.3, which would likely fall in the summer of 2020, this will mark the halfway point of Shadowbringers. In addition to another dungeon and 24 man, we will possibly get another ultimate, though we really only get two per expansion. So that might wait till patch 5.5. And this is where we add Deep Dungeon. This is a progressive tower to be taken on in parties of 1 to 4, and you rapidly level a class inside. When you die, your run is over. It grants experience and cool rewards upon completion, and getting to the top takes a lot of work, so huge congrats to anyone that has cleared it. Now, 4.0 called theirs Heaven on High, and it was simply an iteration on the original one in 3.0 called Palace of the Dead. I'm excited to see what 5.0 brings, since the land of the first, where 5.0 takes place, could totally change the rules of the past iterations. It's possible the Deep Dungeon and a new treasure map, along with any Hildebrand-style side content, might get spread to patch 5.35, but as we go into patch 5.4, It'll be time to start wrapping up the various stories that we have spun up so far. 5.4 is likely fall of 2020, so there's a good chance it will be the last of the major cycle of things to look forward to in 2020. But don't worry, I'll be talking about all this expansion has to offer, just in case you deciding whether or not to get in in 2020 it hinges on you wanting to know what Shadowbringers will still have to offer as it finishes up its entire patch cycle 
from a fantastic launch all the way to 6.0. Now this will wrap up the trial story and usually gives us a dungeon that will help start setting the tone for where the main story can go from here. To this point, I have worked very hard to avoid spoiling the story of 14, but just know that we have some serious ramifications that could be coming to a head here. Ishgard and other features will have continued being added to date, so just know that these are all additive in nature, and I have not seen any other game that matches the amount of content per patch cycle that 14 offers. This content cycle is announced through two-part live letters that are hours long, and in addition to regular communication such as letters and Q&As and panels at various events from the dev team, the devs for this game are incredible. They play it. They listen. They care about 14. I can't back it up in this single video, but if you wonder why such a friendly community can sometimes be so protective, it is because the devs and what they give us is something to be cherished. And I can only wish that every single other community has the support that Yoshi P and his team offers the players of Final Fantasy XIV. Now at this point we move into the last patch cycle, and now we should be looking at the end of the Ishgardian Restoration and possibly a new player housing district there. Now all along the way, all of these various side contents will have continued receiving updates. There's rumors of a possible snowboarding game being added to Golden Saucer, seasonal events, PvP seasons, whatever Ishgard and the Relic spins up, optional things like leaderboards, and so, so much more. If you aren't catching a trend of why this game is worth trying, the amount of content you can opt into if you want to is so, so much to play, which means that even if you just cherry pick the individual things that appeal to you, it's a lot of good things to get into. Now by this point we will likely have learned if there is a new limited job and possibly are going hands on with it before 6.0 drops since that's what we did with Blue Mage. That may end up being announced around FanFest but we'll just have to see. If I had to guess, I would say the next limited job is Beastmaster or Puppet Master, but that is a guess, nothing more. If we had not gotten a second ultimate, or if they decided to do three, as was hoped for in Stormblood but did not happen, this would be where it fits. And really going into the end of the expansion, it is a great way to end things. So if you are looking to take place in a world first race, not quite like any other, this is the one to gear up for. At any point along this journey, keep an eye out for cross-game interactions like when Monster Hunter World gave us the Rathalos fight, and that is just one among many others. They can also drop surprises in. This is a huge content cycle, but if they want to surprise us, they can. And if that, so far, has not shown you why 14 has enough content to be well worth it in 2020, just let me know in the comments down below what you need more of. I seriously think PvP is probably the only exception if you are a solely PvP player, but if you just like PvP as a side thing, I think even then there is still plenty here. Now lastly, let's assume all of that sounds good. Great expansion, so far, plenty more to come, but if I jump in for the very first time, will it be worth the effort to catch up? They've worked very hard to make it easier and easier to get in, and are not stopping that goal as they continue to make the new player experience better and better. For you new players, as of today, you have two options. You can buy, with cash, a jump potion to get to the end of the last expansion so that you can start at the beginning of Shadowbringers or you can start from A Realm Reborn, sometimes called 2.0, and to skip all of this, you would have to buy a story skip potion and a leveling one. These are sometimes on sale. I wouldn't get one without the other because having a level capped character and then having to blast through story will still take a long time, and knocking out the story with a skip potion and then not really having the understanding of the game to level up with the alternative leveling systems might feel a little bit frustrating. So I would decide one or the other. The grind to current cap and getting caught up has taken some creators that jumped in just this year, like Skill Up, close to 400 hours depending on how they play, but that's them being incredibly thorough. I will say even if you blast through it and skip cutscenes and optional side content, it is still likely a talk of weeks, possibly months, not days. So getting through it, just be aware, this game is dense. 
Now of the two, I would strongly encourage you to try doing it with playing versus skipping if you are on the fence. This will give you the context you need through playing through all the different zones and being gradually introduced to all of the features and various things that a skip to 10 levels below current cap will simply gloss right over. And that's before we even talk about the importance of story if you want to be caught up on the lore. A Realm Reborn was them launching from 1.0 and this game rebuilding itself is such a turnaround that it should be the poster child of what could but likely won't come of any major change in direction that a game could ever take for the better. With both battle and profession jobs being switchable with the swap of a weapon or tool, they gave us things from grindy content like upgradable weapon systems, which we call Relic, as well as a whole slew of instanced content and zones that act as a backdrop for things like player housing, which is what many players aim to one day own. It was a huge start to this game and has acted as the basis for many of the things that are so seamlessly put in it that I can't always remember what expansion a particular piece of content was added in. In ARR, we got the basis of what is now our character creation screen, but it's been expanded to the point that we can now even play as bunnies or lions with huge amounts of customization. Typically, you would only do this once since all of your classes live on one character, so it's a great thing to offer. Years later, we can go get lost in things like card games, sightseeing logs, cosmetic systems, all built on top of what ARR initially gave us, and while many of the limitations of the current development cycle are constraints from the code written to relaunch this game on the faulty ground that was 1.0, this experience set the tone for what many systems from combat to gearing and even the social side of content systems will go to build on in Shadowbringers and beyond. Many of the systems are iterative, so you get a, for example, you get a chocobo companion that goes around and fights with you in ARR, and then eventually that moves into a squadron type system where you have NPCs and moves into the trust system, and they all kind of build on each other. So it's great to see them as they progressed, even though they still today kind of function separate from each other. It's honestly surprising how far some of the systems like flying, jump puzzles, and large-scale instance content can exist within a game that has parts as old as it does. Without a redo, like games that we've seen in the past that possibly did a 2 on the second half, but 14 is among those select few that have made it. It is not alone on that elite list of truly service-based games that stand the test of time, but it deserves praise for being on the list just the same. It is currently beloved because of, not in spite of its age, and it it is a point of pride in this community how far it has and continues to grow. It is an incredible game and is continuing to be so. Each expansion moving forward appears to be two more jobs, though I can't imagine that pace is sustainable forever, and they have added races to the point where they say they are sure as of today that they would never add more. We then moved into 3.0. Heavensward hit a stride that of what could be achieved, and many players from the 1.0 Legacy days viewed this as the best of what this game could aim to achieve. At this point, we added more ways to level, we took an iterative step on most of kind of what I was describing, and gave us a deeper understanding of the world, and gave us lots of what any good game needs, dragons. 4.0 was a move to more Eastern aesthetic as we moved into Stormblood. We iterated even further on things, taking a crazy leap into alternate ways to define PvE with the limited job system I mentioned earlier. And the Relic literally took on a whole new world called Eureka. And we added swimming, which gave us new perspectives on open world zones and the way we interact with them. Heavensward was just so good that many may have felt less dragons and less surprises in the content cycle outside of the relic grind and the new limited job was a step not taken far enough or possibly for some backwards, but it's got a lot of neat things such as some of my favorite beast tribes so far. The crossover events were pretty mind blowing. So that catches us up to Shadowbringers. As a possible new player, you may try to take your time, and it could take months to get there, but know that the game can be enjoyed solo and with new systems like New Game Plus and paired with dungeon group finding systems that literally give them a roulette to come play with you. There's plenty of other ways for friends or even strangers to come enjoy the content as you get through it. PvP even opens up at level 30 and everybody's scaled, so you only have to get to level 30 on a job to try it, and you gain experience in there, so there's plenty of that to enjoy. Though I will say, if this is truly your first time through the game, pick one job and focus solely on the main story as much as possible to get to cap as quickly as possible. 
While there are many faster ways to level, and I'm telling you to take your time, I have seen many people get burned out because they end up taking too long and then they feel like the game never becomes what got them in in the first place. Most of the content in the game is locked behind some level of story, so on your first job I would stick to it as much as you can knowing that you can always go back and there's plenty of benefits to waiting to go back and level up other jobs later. You will use all sorts of other ways to level to have whole new experiences leveling up other jobs. So just enjoy the story the first time around and just know that all these other experiences will be great ways to try other ways to play. Many players start and they're playing alone and they get burned out before even making it to level 51, which is kind of the start of Heaven's Word since ARR capped us at 50. And I cannot express how worth the wait the grind is. We have a ton of guides for you here on the channel and the community as a whole is very welcoming as a general rule. Just ask if you need help and just know that the game is slow paced if you're wanting to take the time to enjoy the story. Just have that in mind. The quest design gets better as you go through more recent content and in 5.3 we're getting a story squish which is going to go back and reevaluate that first 50 levels to make the barrier to what is possibly the best current MMO on the market even easier for new players to jump in and enjoy. Now should you as a new player want something outside of the traditional MMORPG experience we have largely focused on so far, I have great news. This game has everything from treasure maps, which are some of the most fun you can have in a group. They are designed for level cap, just as a heads up, and people tend to run only the most current one because it's the best loot, but there, it is possible to go find groups for older ones if you're a lower level and you want to start getting mixed up in that in the party finder system. As we talk about side content, the party system aims to put players with unique goals together, even across servers for literally anything you can think of. Want to play an old piece of content with only one class in the group? Do it. You want to farm up old mounts from extremes? Do that. Anything you don't want to find solo, there is a party finder group just waiting for you or for you to set up to find people for. But anyways, yes, there's Golden Saucer, a whole new slew of mini games from adventures... Uh, racing chocobos to playing arcade games. It's a massive amount of side content and good for a lot of laughs. It's where my pig suit came from. The crafting and gathering system cannot be explained how large it is. They have made it easier than ever to get started in once you have access to the restoration of Ishgard content. So once you have a player at cap and decide to try it out, it is worth a shot for sure. Now from there you could go try a deep dungeon, a progressive tower that restarts if you die and gives you experience to you in the world as you attempt it and you gather cool experiences from it. Pretty much every piece of game in this content offers really cool appearances in their glamour system. I of course choose to run around as that metallic blue pig, but the sky's the limit on how diverse this system is and it continues to surprise me every time they add new items, new haircuts, new dyes, new ways to stand and emotes and all sorts of new items to get. The cosmetic system here is enormous. And yes, there is a cash shop on top of this if you want to hand them more money, but the system is huge even without that. We have companions, we have mounts, we have NPC groups we can level, a personal chocobo we can level, and even feed foods to change colors, and so, so much more. If you are new, you could literally just pick out the things that most interest you, and that will likely allow you to play this game with all of your free time and not catch up any time soon. In 2021, we would get 6.0, and that will add even more content. So if at this point you have never tried this game, it's at least worth trying the free trial to consider making the jump. The free trial allows you to play unlimited hours through the first half of ARR on all the jobs that were available back then, but it is just a taste of what's to come. The game does a great job of holding your hand at this phase to get you settled and then letting you loose as you get further and further into the last six years of content. Returning players should keep an eye out for free login campaigns that they run from time to time if they're just looking to get that taste to decide if the game is worth getting back into. Getting to Heaven's Word is the first time I really feel the game shines for a new player. Not because I didn't love ARR when it was current content, but because the game is just so, so good in Heaven's Word that really compared to ARR, I think Heaven's Word is just such a good time. Now, I mentioned FanFest earlier. I assume that it'll be in November of 2020, and we will get the first of three conventions. These are held every other year for 14 fans worldwide, and the pattern is the first one in North America, then one in Europe, and lastly, one in Japan. Brian and I will be attending the North American one like we did last time, and this is not only a chance to get to listen in on panels with the devs and spend time with fellow fans or play in a real-life golden saucer, but this is also how they slowly start to leak out the information and prepare us for the next expansion in 2021. This is where they start to reveal things like new classes. They swore we wouldn't get a new race. 
a hint at where the story may go from here, as well as system changes that are too big for the five large content patches we get per expansion, such as sweeping battle system changes or server changes that affect the stability of scale of what the game can offer on down the road, it, it's just a great time for them to start to talk about the direction of where we go from here. Last time, it's where we found out that we literally now have the ability to play from one server to the other, even in the open world, and it's an optional thing. I just opt in to literally visiting other worlds. It's a game changer to the point where it's even had unintentional consequences, and they've proven the ability to adjust that as well. It's incredible what they do to support this game, and the devs really get a chance to show that in and around FanFest, even more so than they do the rest of a two-year cycle. Now, I am thrilled you are considering 14 as a game that you will make time for in 2020, and I have large goals myself for what I want to achieve both in-game and for the channel this year, and I look forward to sharing that journey with you. While this video was long and I talked fast, this is still just a summary. I likely glossed over or forgot something, possibly just phrased it in a way that left you wanting a bit more info, so feel free to comment here or on any of the videos we have here on the channel. With literally thousands of posts, we do our best to cover everything we can, and we try to read and respond to all the comments we get ourselves, but others here on the channel also do a great job of answering any questions or concerns you may have, as well as join in on the joy as you share what you are working on or have completed so far. Our Discord server is also free to join in the description below, uh, so please feel free to come by and say hello in a more, I guess that's like a live format where it's a faster response. And this game is just like many others, where of course joy can be found in time on your own, but it is enhanced when you share it with others. In my opinion, if you have a friend that wants to join in with you, or you were talking about inviting a friend for the first time, or have a friend that's already playing that's trying to get you in on this game, sharing 14 with them is one of the best experiences I have ever had in gaming. It's just an incredible way to play together. Thanks for watching, and I hope you enjoyed this year's Is Final Fantasy XIV Worth Playing? I'm thrilled that it still feels so, so worth it, and I hope to be this excited for 2021 when the time for the video comes around again. My name is Chris with work to game Take care, thank you so much, and I'll see you next time.